So good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining the Canadian Celiac Association uh, webinar on navigating precautionary labeling in Canada. I'm Melissa Secord, the Executive Director for the Canadian Celiac Association and your host for tonight. So the Canadian Celiac Association, fondly known as the CCA, is helping to empower individuals with celiac disease, dermatitis herpetiformis, or gluten sensitivity. Thanks to our generous supporters and donors, we help advance some, some of the key following uh, areas. Advocating for access to safe gluten-free food, working to improve diagnosis rates and management of the disease by educating healthcare community and generating awareness, empowering individuals through science-based information, and education. Um, CCA also publishes uh, some, uh, some uh, electronic publications. Uh, today we sent out our Better Living Gluten-Free Holiday Edition, and we have three times a year we have the Canadian Celiac Magazine. Um, so some of the information that we kind of deliver to you, and uh, please consider signing up for them to have them, uh, you know, right in, delivered right into your inbox each month. I uh, just wanted to let everybody know also that we do have a client and peer support service. And uh, once a week, we have a registered dietitian available to answer your questions. Uh, she's available Thursdays from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern, and it is a free service. Again, thanks to our amazing donors and supporters, um, we've been able to make this service available to individuals. We also have a peer support network where we have individuals across Canada, um, who are available for in-depth, up to one-hour peer support and follow-up uh, by trained um, volunteers. So please consider, if you're newly diagnosed, taking advantage of this amazing service. Uh, CCA is a charity, and every day thousands of the Canadians are wondering what has made them so sick. And we do heavily rely on donations. Well, we've just started our annual festive campaign and hoping to raise $30,000, and we hope that through education like this available, our peer support and other resources, along with our advocacy and investing in research, that you'll think to support the CCA this holiday season. Um, we really can't do it without you. And it's thanks to our generous donors that we can help others in the community. Uh, just some ground rules for tonight. Uh, we Everyone is muted so that everyone can enjoy the speaker. If you have a question, please use the question and answer box, the Q&A box. It may be at the top or bottom of your screen. You can feel free to type the questions as we go. We may be a bit tight on time tonight. So what we'll do is we do log the questions and we can put out some um, information, uh, Q&A um, after the webinar, or we may need to generate another webinar depending on how our timing and the questions go. Um, we are recording, so in case you missed something, uh, the session will be put up on our YouTube channel in the, in the coming days, and we'll send a notification out uh, through your registration link email that you provided. And please tell us how we did. Um, tomorrow you'll be receiving a survey in your inbox. Um, we can only improve when we know about the feedback we receive, and please share any new topics that you'd like to see CCA present. And uh, now I'd like to introduce our speaker. Uh, we have Shelly Case with us tonight. She is a leading international expert on celiac disease and the gluten-free diet. Uh, Shelly is um, a registered dietitian, author, speaker, consult for more than 35 years. She's uh, been a long-standing member of CCA's Professional Advisory Council. Shelly is a sought-after media source conducting hundreds of radio, TV, newspaper, and magazine interviews throughout North America. And as a popular speaker, she delivers numerous presentations at medical, nutrition, and celiac and food industry conferences throughout North America. She is the author of many celiac uh, articles on celiac disease and the gluten-free diet in leading medical and nutrition journals. In addition, she has contributed to a variety of other publications for health professionals, such as textbooks, magazines, and patient education resources. She's most famous for her best-selling book, Gluten-Free Diet, The Definitive Resource Guide, and is highly recommended, which is highly recommended by healthcare professionals, celiac organizations, consumers in the food industry. In recognition of Shelley's major contributions to the field of celiac disease and her dedication to educating health professionals and individuals with celiac and gluten sensitivity, she was awarded the Queen Elizabeth Golden Jubilee Medal. 
Uh, she was also given an appreciation award for her contributions to the development of safe gluten-free oats protocols and regulatory standards. And she's also been awarded a lifetime membership by the CCA, which has only been bestowed by 16, to 16 other people uh, to date. In addition to uh, her food and nutrition expertise, Shelly has celiac disease herself and allergies, so she understands the challenges firsthand of following a strict gluten-free diet for life. Shelly and her family live in Calgary, and uh, bonus tonight, uh, we'll have one lucky winner of a participant um, that will win a uh, one of Shelly's books. So uh, watch for details um, coming in your inbox um, for that chance to win. So I'm going to now uh, send it over to Shelly. Thank you so much, Melissa. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. That's great. I must apologize, everyone. I've been battling a really bad cold and a coughing spell, so I've been steaming my head over hot water before we started this, so hopefully I won't run into any trouble. But we have a very complex and challenging topic tonight and an ambitious agenda. So next slide, Melissa. Uh, what I would like to do is just give you an overview of what we're going to cover in the next hour is I'm going to talk about allergen and gluten-free labeling, precautionary labeling, going to share the results of our CCA labeling survey uh, that we did back in May, and then try to give you a few labeling reading guidelines and how to make those decisions uh, on those confusing labels. So next slide. First, we need to set the stage about what's going on in Canada for labeling for food allergens and gluten sources and sulfites. After many, many years, actually 14 years of advocacy work by the CCA, allergy associations, and others, including our very own Marian Zarkavis, a dietitian and longtime member of the Celiac, Canadian Celiac Professional Advisory Council, she was instrumental in starting this journey towards improved labeling regulations. And finally, after those 14 years, this Schedule 1220 enhanced labeling for food allergens and gluten sources and added sulfites was finally passed that came into force on August the 4th of 2012. And with this new regulation that was passed, all the priority allergens gluten sources and added sulfites must now be declared on the label of prepackaged foods. Next slide. And so what are those priority allergens? Well, you can see wheat or triticale uh, and then nuts, various types of nuts, milk, eggs, soybeans, crustaceans, shellfish, fish, sulfites, sesame seeds, mustard seed, or any protein, modified protein or protein fraction from any of those priority allergens. Now also when they did this, they gave a definition of gluten. And you can see that it's wheat, rye, barley, triticale, but they also have oats in there. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment because this does cause some real confusion for people about oats. Next slide. So the way it has to be done on the label is that if any of those um, priority food allergens, gluten sources or sulfides are in the ingredients, or a component of an ingredient, it must be declared either in your list of ingredients by their common name. So for example, you could do casein, but you would have to put in brackets milk because not everyone would know that casein is actually milk or malt. You'd have to say barley, graham flour, wheat, or you could just declare it as milk, barley, or wheat in the ingredient list. If you don't choose to, if the manufacturer doesn't declare it in the list of ingredients, the other option is they can include it in the contains statement immediately following the list of ingredients. So either in the list of ingredients or the contain statement. Next. Now, one of the things that we had also when this um, 1220 was revised in 2011, um, um, what happened is they revised our existing gluten-free regulation, which we actually have had in since 1995, and it was revised so that it would be in sync as well with um, the Schedule 1220. And you can see the, the ruling B.24.018 says it's prohibited to label it, package, sell, or advertise a food in a manner likely to create an impression that it is a gluten-free food if the food contains any gluten protein, modified gluten-free protein, or any gluten protein fraction. And the next slide will define what they said was gluten. So gluten means it's any pro gluten protein from the grains from the following cereals, barley, oats, rye, triticale, wheat. And someone was asking about spelt. Yes, spelt is a type of wheat. So einkorn, emmer, uh, and spelt are all examples of uh, ancient varieties of wheat that would fall into this category. 
And so that was the definition of gluten. So next slide. Now, what about oats? So we have oats listed in that definition of gluten like wheat, rye, and barley. And the reason why it was kept in there in the regulation was because we know that oats are highly contaminated. And we'll talk about that in a few moments. Next slide. So when the Schedule 1220 amendments were made, Health Canada was also working on updating their position on gluten-free claims in this document that was published in June of 2012, and it is available on Health Canada's website. Next. So in this document, it highlighted, highlighted that there was, even though there's no regulation for a specific gluten threshold level, Health Canada considers levels of gluten protein less than 20 parts per million, generally do not represent a health risk for consumers with celiac disease. So although it wasn't written into the gluten-free regulation, it is in that guidance document saying that they must be under the 20 parts. And this 20 part per million threshold level is the same as it is with the FDA in the U US. Now consumers have expressed that they don't want to have products with a gluten-free claim unless it's made in dedicated gluten-free facilities. However, in this gluten-free guidance document, there was no regulatory requirement for the type of facilities where gluten-free products are made. It's just that the products, wherever they're made, must meet this regulation under the 20 parts per million. Next. So what is 20 parts per million? Well, I explained that in quite in depth in my book, but let's just kind of try and do a real short version here. 20 parts per million is the same as having 20 grams of gluten in one kilogram of food or another way of expressing that, it would be two milligrams of gluten in 100 grams of food. So about three ounces, just a little over three ounces of food, there could be no, no more than two milligrams. So that's the threshold. Now that is not necessarily what manufacturers are aiming for. They really want no detectable gluten so that there's no risk of having a, a recall. But that is the threshold, the 20 parts per million or two milligrams per 100 grams. Next. So Health Canada sets the regulations the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, which we refer to as the CFIA, not the CIA, but the CFIA, they enforce Health Canada's um, gluten-free regulations and claims. Next. So now I just want to go back and talk a little bit about oats because, as I mentioned, people are quite confused. Well, why are oats in the list of the gluten-containing grains in that B regulation? And uh, I'm going to walk you through a little bit of this so you can better understand it. We've had um, real challenges here in Canada trying to find a regulatory solution for allowing specialty produced purity protocol oats to be labeled gluten free. And I've been involved on this oats file, it seems forever, in my role um, uh, as on the PAC along with other members of the PAC and the CCA Board of Directors. And we have worked really closely with key stakeholders at Ca Health Canada, the CFIA and oat producers. Next. So one of the issues why oats were not considered safe is because this is a study done by the Health Canada scientist. Uh, Terry Corner did this study in 2011. And you can see that various types of oats were very contaminated with gluten. 93% of the samples they tested were over 20 parts and some as high as 37.84. Um, so extremely high. Next slide. So coming back to our um, discussion, remember that 20 parts per million is the regular threshold. And so some of those were 700 parts and even higher. So clearly oats were not safe and that was why they left it in the definition of gluten. Next. But during this time, and in fact back in the early 2000s, we had a, a company who was able to produce purity protocol oats where they were using pure oat seed, they were making sure that the crop rotation was such on the fields that there was no wheat, rye, or barley on those fields for at least three years, and they used dedicated or thoroughly cleaned equipment for the seeding, the harvest, when they were storing and transporting it to the mill, as well as the processing and packaging, and they were doing gluten testing. So we had these oats that were on the market, but they were not able to call them gluten-free because the regulation has identified oats as in the list of gluten-containing grains. Next slide. 
And even back in 2007, Health Canada did have a uh, document on celiac disease and the safety of oats. And they con uh, concurred that, the un that uncontaminated pure oats were safe for the majority of people with celiac, but we still had that regulation in 2007 defining oats in the list of gluten. Next. So after a long time um, of a lot of work, uh, actively working the CCA with Health Canada and Agriculture and Agri-Foods, we finally came up with a regulatory solution to, the, to allow these pure uncontaminated oats to be labeled as gluten-free, as the scientific literature was demonstrating that the vast majority of people with celiac could safely consume these specially produced oats. So finally in May 2015, the Minister of Health issued a special marketing authorization. Next. Now what this was is that they would not be able to change the existing regulation. Oats were still left in the definition of, uh, of uh, gluten containing grains, but this marketing authorization enabled the Minister of Health to exempt specially produced oats that were purity um, uncontaminated oats from the existing regulation, and so they could be labeled gluten-free oats. Now, Health Canada didn't specify the methods or the controls that had to be used to produce these gluten-free oats, but they did say that the finished product cannot contain more than 20 parts per million of gluten from wheat, rye, and barley, or any of the hybridized strains, such as the um, triticale or the other ancient varieties of wheat. And what's unique here in Canada, which it isn't in the States, if a manufacturer are using these specialty uh, oats, so say gluten-free oats, gluten-free uh, oat flour, gluten-free oatmeal, they have to use in the list of ingredients the words gluten-free oats or gluten-free oatmeal, gluten-free oat bran, um, so that people would be able to clearly identify that these are different oats than your traditional regular oats. Next slide. So I was very thrilled to be part of oh, the next one, Melissa. I was really thrilled to be um, representing CCA with a member of parliament in May when we made this joint announcement and talked to the press about uh, this long, long journey of getting oats to be able to be labeled gluten free. Next. So at that same time that that announcement was made, Health Canada updated the 2007 uh, position uh, document on celiac disease and gluten free claims on uncontaminated oats. And that is also on the CCA website next and on Health Canada's website. So the CCA updated the previous um, OATS position statement uh, in uh, concert with it at the same time as the Health Canada one came out so that people knew what that um, statement was. And so you can get to, if you go to celiac.ca OATS hyphen statement, that will take you to our position statement and it'll also have links to take you to those Health Canada documents on OATS. So that is kind of a crash course, next, next one, that's a crash course on the allergen and gluten labeling. So now what I want to switch to, and hopefully everybody's still with me, Melissa, is the, is the call coming through clear? Uh, Melissa? Yes, yes, you are. Sorry, I'm on mute. Okay, <laughs> just, uh, okay. sorry, I just want to make sure because when you're talking out to outer space, you're not sure if anybody's there. So, okay, good. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is allergen-free claims. Uh, next slide. So an allergen-free claim, the other way, please. Next slide. One more. Yes. Okay. Um, an allergen-free claim is a negative statement or claim pertaining to the absence of food allergen sources. So things like peanut-free, wheat-free, um, and where they name the food allergen and then free claim or they say contains no wheat or contains no peanuts. Um, it must if you're making, if the manufacturer is making that claim, they must ensure there is absolutely no amount of the food allergen source in the product, whether through intentional or inadvertent means. Next. So um, Health Canada also has a guidance document on food allergen precautionary statements that came out in March of 2012. Next. And the CFIA also has more information uh, on this as well uh, on their websites. Next. So what are food allergen precautionary statements or sometimes in the States and other places they call them allergen advisory statements? Well, statements such as may contain wheat or milk or wheat and milk made in a facility that uses wheat 
or processed on equipment that also processes wheat, nuts, and soy. So those are just a few examples of the types of precautionary statements that you can see on labels. And the purpose of these precautionary statements are to alert the consumer of possible inadvertent presence of an allergen in food. So um, what's interesting about this is there are no regulations for these precautionary statements. Uh, they can be used on a voluntary basis. And so in other words, manufacturers can decide based on their own criteria whether or not they want to make a precautionary statement on a product label. So unlike the mandatory re regulations for declarations of allergens, gluten sources, and sulfides, sulfites, when they're added as an ingredient or a component of an ingredient, um, that, that is totally different what we were talking about before. This is the possible inadvertent presence of the allergen in the food, and it's not mandatory. It's on a voluntary basis. However, their Health Canada does state that even though there's no regulations, they should be truthful and not misleading. Next slide. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, um, so even though there's no specific regulations when to use these precautionary statements, food manufacturers are required to develop and implement a traceability system and preventative controls to anticipate and address potential food safety risks, including the possibility of unintentionally introducing allergens or gluten sources. Um, can you go back, Melissa? And we're going to stay on this for a few minutes. So when a manufacturer uh, identifies actual occurrences of cross-contamination with these priority allergens or gluten sources, they must take actions to ensure their foods do not represent a health risk to consumers. They may choose to implement further control measures to completely eliminate this cause of cross-contamination and thus avoid the risk that there are undeclared allergens or gluten sources ending up in their products or when they feel that cross-contamination cannot be completely eliminated despite all reasonable control measures, they can use these precautionary statements to warn consumers of this potential unintentional presence of an allergen or gluten source. So these prepackaged foods that represent a health risk to consumers due to undeclared presence of a food allergen or gluten sources due to cross-contamination, they're subject to the enforcement actions by CFIA, which may include relabeling or an actual food recall. So the manufacturers cannot use these statements as a substitute for these good manufacturing pr processes. So as I mentioned, they can only be used when, despite error, all the attempts to make sure there's no inadvertent presence, if it's un uh, completely unavoidable, they can use these precautionary statements. But um, Health Canada has also said that these statements should not be used when there's no real risk of an allergen being present in the food. So that's a little bit of information there. Um, the other thing, before we go on, Melissa, to the next slide, I just want to say that um, for people that have maybe never been in a manufacturing plant, the challenge of cross-contamination is that it can, it, can, it can occur in a manufacturing facility during the time they receive and store their ingredients or when products might be made on shared equipment. So the may contain statement is often used when the product is manufactured in a facility where there's shared practices because it's not always possible for them to thoroughly and effectively clean the equipment between batches that contain ingredients that might be a source of these priority allergens or gluten sources. And, and the other challenge for manufacturers is that, um, you know, if there is a, a very low risk of the allergen being present, it may not be evenly distributed across a batch, so thus making it difficult to detect the presence with their analytical methods. So you don't know which lot might be contaminated and which might not. So it's not um, a real easy um, a subject to try and um, make it black and white, but they try to do their very best, and that, those are the guidelines for the precautionary label statements. Next. So one, uh, one thing that is under regulation for the food allergens uh, precautionary statements is in 2016, they passed a regulation saying, that although they haven't given a lot of guidance on, um, and, and there are no specific regulations for the use of the precautionary statements, they did pass this regulation that will come into effect December 2021 that will require these precautionary statements to be immediately following the list of ingredients, or if a contained statement is used, it has to be right after that. So with, without a specific regulation or specific wording, 
um, you can see all kinds of statements. Even though Health Canada and CFIA recommend that manufacturers actually only use one precautionary statement, and that is may contain, in the case of what we're talking about wheat, uh, or may contain eggs, or may contain peanuts. But the, that can be challenging because we see all kinds of statements still being used, even though they recommend that, we still see a, a, a wide variety of different types of statements. Next. So I want to talk a little bit about where it really gets quite confusing is when you see an allergen-free claim in conjunction with a precautionary label. So Health Canada said it's not acceptable for, for the naming of the allergen-free claim and then having a may contain. So in other words, you could not make a product saying wheat-free and then having a may contain wheat. However, they do have exceptions in certain situations where the manufacturer could make a claim wheat-free along with a statement saying produced in a facility that also produces wheat. So that doesn't necessarily mean that it's may contain, it's just produced in a facility that also produces wheat but the manufacturer must ensure that their allergen-free claim is accurate. So that's an example of the allergen-free claims. Next one. Now, where it gets confusing is that gluten-free is a little different. They will allow a gluten-free claim and a may contain wheat, but they say it should be done with caution. And why they will allow it is, is that because there could be extremely low levels of wheat that might be a problem for a consumer that has wheat allergies. Uh, so they would allow that. But once again, the manufacturer must ensure the product contains no intentionally added gluten sources and the product must be less than the 20 parts per million gluten as a result of any cross-contamination. So they are encouraging manufacturers to use a statement, may contain less than 20 parts per million of wheat, although I have rarely seen anything like that. I usually have just seen the gluten-free claim and a may contain wheat. Next. So what about research that's been done on these type of claims? Um, there has been a little bit of research, not a lot, but um, um, a, a group of dietitians, Tricia Thompson, Tricia Lyons, and Amy Jones in the United States published research in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2016, and the title of their um, uh, article was Allergen Advisory Statements for Wheat. Do they help U.S. consumers with celiac disease make food, safe food choices? And what they did is they looked at labeling information, retrospectively reviewed it from 101 products that been, had been tested for gluten through Gluten-Free Watchdog, which is um, Tricia Thompson's company, where she tests all kinds of products to see the gluten content. Now, these products were not labeled gluten-free, but they appeared to be free of any gluten-containing ingredients based on a review of the ingredient list. So they looked at these products. They had no gluten-containing ingredients. Uh, there was no gluten-free claim. And what did they find? Well, <clears throat> they found that of the 87 products, so they tested these 101 products, 87 products that did not include an advisory statement for wheat or gluten, 13 of those contain quantifiable gluten at, above, uh, at or above five parts per million. And of those 80, um, 13 that did contain quantifiable gluten, four of them tested over 20 parts per million. So this is interesting. There was no allergen advisory statement, and yet those products tested um, uh, four of them at least tested over 20 parts. Now, interesting, of the 14 products that did have an allergy advisement, advisory statement for wheat, only one contained quantifiable gluten, and it did test at or above 20 parts per million. So you, you really expected the opposite. The ones with the allergen advisory statement should have potentially had more gluten and the ones without it shouldn't have had the gluten in it. So they concluded that allergen advisory statements for wheat were not a useful predictor of the gluten content in their database review. Next. Now that same group of dietitians led by Tricia Thompson from Gluten-Free Watchdog published another study in the European Journal of Clinical Nutrition in 2018. Where, they, um, where labeling information was retro retrospectively reviewed from 328 products that had a gluten-free claim. So in their other study, there was no gluten-free claim. This one had a gluten-free claim, and they had tested gluten for these products. 
So I'm going to walk you through this. It's a little bit of a complicated slide, so we'll go slow. So if you look on the far right where it says no allergen advisory statement for wheat or gluten, that was a total of 297 products of the total 328 that they had um, tested and looked at. So of the, um, there was 297 products that did not include an allergen advisory statement if you add 285 and 12. Then if you go to the other column where they did have, it contained an allergen advisory statement for wheat or gluten, there were 31 products, 29 and two for a total of 31 that didn't have a claim, uh, or that did have a claim. Of the 297 that did not include an advisory statement over on the far right, 39 of those contain quantifiable gluten at or above five parts per million, and 12 of the products tested at or above 20 parts per million. So there was no advisory statement, but they found that 12 of those products um, were over 20 parts. Now, if you go to the column where the contained allergen advisory statements for wheat or gluten, of the 31 products that did have that advisory warning on the, there, three did contain quantifiable gluten at or above five, and two of the products that tested at or above 20 parts per million. So there were two that were at or above 20 parts. So the ones that um, were contaminated over the 20 parts, those 14, 11 of them were grain-based products. So five of those 11 grain-based products that were over 20 parts per million were oats, two were beverages, and one was a spice. So um, as in Canada, the U.S. Um, FDA also will permit a gluten-free claim um, as well as a precautionary statement for wheat, provided they meet the gluten-free regulation of less than 20 parts per million of gluten threshold. So that just is an interesting study. Again, it um, gives you a snapshot, it, although it's not every product. Um, it just gives you a sense of there's real challenges with the contains uh, when they're using an allergen advisory statement or no allergen advisory statement. Next. So then they combined the data from both studies and they found that 9% or 4 out of the 45 that did have an allergen advisory statement for wheat or gluten contained quantifiable gluten, but the ones where there was no allergen advisory statement for wheat or gluten um, contained quantifiable gluten. You can see that 14%, so 52 out of the 384. So they conclude that consumers should not make gluten-free purchasing decisions solely on the presence or absence of an allergen advisory statement for wheat or gluten. And they recommended that the FDA should strongly consider regulating allergen advisory statements uh, and having more um, specific regulations there. So that's just a, an overview of gluten-free allergen labeling as well as, as these precautionary statements. So now what I'd like to do in the next slide is share with you the Canadian Celiac Association's online survey that we did of consumers and dietitians to gauge their confidence in the understanding of may contains and other precautionary statements, uh, their understanding of the, um, the label claim gluten-free, and when there were no gluten-containing ingredients listed on a product. So we had four groups, those that had been diagnosed with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet, uh, the second group was not officially diagnosed with celi uh, celiac, but they were on a gluten-free diet. Uh, another group would have been a parent or a caregiver of someone with celiac disease on a gluten-free diet, and then dietitians. And we did this in this past May, and we advertised on social media sites, and it was amazing the response we got within one week. 56% uh, of the respondents were CCA members. Next. So this goes to show you how dedicated our celiac and gluten-free community is. We received in one week over 2,300 uh, responses to our survey. And as you can see, most of them, 78% were those diagnosed with celiac, 6%. They weren't diagnosed with celiac but had been on a gluten-free diet. We had some caregivers and parents, 15%. And then we only had 1% for dietitians. We'd like to redo this survey and get more dietitian input. But it was done on a, um, very quickly, and we were happy to at least see we had a good uh, turnout. Next. So we know that our celiac uh, and gluten-free uh, and people with gluten sensitivity, our gluten-free uh, community is our very savvy consumers. So just like our mice, they're constantly reading labels and don't touch anything until they um, read that label thoroughly. Next. So here are some of the questions and the results. 
what did we find? Well, we asked them, do you consume, or can, for the dietitians, can a person with celiac disease consume products with a precautionary statement on the label? And interesting results. We gave them three types of precautionary statements and asked, would you consume it? Yes, no, or it depends on the type of product. And you can see that um, very few people were going to consume a product uh, that had a may contain, only 4%, 77% no, but interesting, 19% said it really depended on the type of product. Now, what about made on shared equipment with wheat? Again, very few people would consume it. Uh, a few more, 81% said they uh, um, uh, would not consume it. And again, 15% said it depends on the type of product. But interesting, some people almost ranked other types of precautionary statements differently because when it was in made in a facility that processes wheat, more people, 11% said that they might consume that product, uh, whereas 57% said no, and, up, and almost a third of the respondents said, depends on the type of product. Next. Then we got into more specific questions. So we asked, if you saw a may contain wheat or some other type of precautionary statement for wheat, and a gluten-free claim, would you consume it? Only 14% said yes, 65% said no, and 21% said it depends on the product. So just so you know, remember I talked earlier, the use of a gluten-free claim and a may contain wheat statement is allowed on the same product, but it should be done with caution. It's really to alert that wheat allergy consumer to the possible presence of low levels of wheat in that gluten-free food but the manufacturer has to ensure that it's less than 20 parts. And they encourage uh, manufacturers to use may contain less than 20 parts per million of wheat, but we don't see those type of statements. We just tend to see may contain wheat and that gluten-free claim. Next. So then we ask the question, well, you look at the product package and you don't see a gluten-free claim. You look at the list of ingredients and contain statement and you don't see anything that looks like gluten listed but you do see a may contains wheat or some variation on a theme of something to do with wheat. So we asked them on grains, would you consume a product uh, of different types of grains if there was a may contain wheat? And you can see that most people wouldn't, although rice was, uh, more people would consume rice, um, deeming that they feel that that is less risky, which is actually true. Rice and wild rice are tending to grow in areas where there is no wheat, and so they are a, a much lower risk item. But I was even surprised to see that 7% would still consume oats that had a may contain wheat and weren't labeled gluten free, when we know the research is showing that they're highly contaminated, regular oats. Next. So then we looked at flours and said, same thing. If you didn't see a gluten-free claim, you didn't find any other gluten-containing ingredients listed, but just this may contain wheat on a bag of amaranth or bean or buckwheat flour, or whatever. And not a lot of people, other than the rice was, and, say, potato, um, would they consume it. Um, most people uh, would not consume it. And even 6%, uh, surprisingly, though, said yes, they would consume uh, oat flour that had a may contain wheat and that was a non-gluten-free labeled oat flour. Next. Now, it was interesting when we looked at the pulse category, lentils, beans, and dried peas. More people, um, compared to some of those other grains and things, would have uh, consumed, uh, would consume lentils, beans, or dried peas if there was a may contain wheat on it. Although 75, about 75% still wouldn't uh, consume it if it had a may contain wheat. Okay, next slide, please. Now, we also asked about different types of seeds and with no gluten-free claim but had a may contain wheat. And again, not a lot of people consuming those. Uh, they, some would, but not a lot. More were avoiding it if it had the may contain wheat. Now, I will tell you that we do have research. Tricia, certainly from Gluten-Free Watchdog, has some, and other studies have shown that fla of all the seeds, flax and hemp are the ones that are most likely to be contaminated with gluten because they are grown here on the prairies and in the U.S. prairies where um, flax and hemp are often in rotation with some of the gluten-containing um, grains. So that's why it is a much more risky uh, ingredient, um, the flax and the hemp. Next. Now we asked uh, people, again, no gluten-free claim, you didn't see any gluten-containing ingredients listed, but you saw this may contain wheat or some other precautionary statement. 
you can see that um, people had different opinions on different categories of food, whether they would consume them or not. But it, there is the trend, other than the nuts, most people would not consume them if they were, uh, had a may contain statement. Next. So now we switched the question up. We, uh, there was no gluten-free claim and no gluten-containing ingredients listed, but there was no precautionary statement. So you just looked on the list of ingredients and you didn't see anything or in a contained statement, and you didn't see a gluten-free claim, would you consume these products um, just if they were a nut, a spice, rice, or wild rice? And you can see that a lot of people had no problem with consuming nuts, spices, rice, and wild rice um, if there was no gluten-free claim on it. Next. But this is the one I thought was quite interesting. Um, uh, so if it didn't have a gluten-free claim or there was no gluten-containing ingredients listed and no may contains, uh, uh, most people would consume the lentils, beans, and dried uh, peas. But if it had a may contain, they would not. So that um, just shows you that, that there is a difference. As soon as they see the may contain wheat, that alerts them to they most likely would not consume it. Now, lest we think that the ones that didn't have a gluten-free claim and no gluten-containing ingredients are, are really safe, let's go to the next slide. Tricia Thompson, um, as I mentioned, at Gluten-Free Watchdog tests all kinds of products, and here she has an example of a product, and as you can see, it's uh, organic um, lentils. There is a, a circle with the GF there. There is a certified gluten-free claim. And, when she, and all the ingredients were organic green lentils. But you can see in the picture on the right there, there are various um, gluten-containing grains that they found in this bag of organic green lentils that were certified gluten-free. And they found that there were samples as high as uh, or greater than 84 parts per million. So this is concerning to see that this certified product um, had gluten in it. Next. So what advice can I give you? Well, here are some lentils from a farm, a farmer friend of ours who gave us these lentils. And I put them out on a cookie sheet. And it's like looking for where is Waldo. And there is a gluten-containing grain smack dab in the very center of that picture. Melissa, can you find where is Waldo? Right there. Yes. So what we recommend is if you cannot find uh, um, pulses, but especially lentils, because they are really more uh, commonly contaminated with gluten-containing grains. You should put them on a cookie sheet and visually do an inspection and pull out any twigs and stones and, and any foreign grains and then put those um, pulses in a colander and rinse them well if you're going to use them uh, if you cannot find gluten-free labeled pulses. Okay, next. Okay, we looked um, um, at other grains that um, didn't have a gluten-free claim and we didn't see any gluten-containing ingredients, most people would, or you know, in many cases as high as 86% for rice, would consume um, uh, these grains even if they didn't have a gluten-free claim. And I was very concerned to see that 33% would consume oat-based products if, um, even if there was no gluten-free claim or gluten-containing ingredients. And remember I explained in Canada that if it just says oats, it means it is not the, it's not the specially produced gluten-free oats. So those ones should be strictly avoided. So that is a bit concerning that a third thought they would do that. Okay, the next one, um, we looked at flowers, other types of flowers. And again, if there was no gluten-free claim, no gluten-containing ingredients listed, you see a real range of you know, over the 50% um, choosing uh, those products. And once again, oat flowers, people were consuming oat flowers without a gluten-free claim. Next. So um, we know that oats are not only the oats and oat flowers have not only been found to be highly contaminated with gluten, but Terry Corner, the same scientist that did that oat study that I shared with you earlier, also uh, they investigated the extent of gluten cross-contamination in naturally gluten-free flours and starches. So they didn't do the oat products as they had previously done those. So now they wanted to look at all of these other naturally inherently gluten-free flours and starches. 
They analyzed 640 samples, and they, these products came from Canada, the States, Europe, and other countries. And interesting, of those 640 samples, the gluten contamination uh, levels ranged from 5 to almost 8,000 parts per million. And I can tell you the 8,000 parts per million was a flax product. Um, so about almost um, just about 10% of the samples that they tested, 61 out of 640, were over the 200 and uh, par or sorry, over the 20 parts per million. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay, next. So then they also looked at the labeling claims on the package and com and compared those claims to how contaminated the samples were. Well, the good news is only three out of the 268 samples that had a gluten-free claim, or about 1%, were over 20 parts per million. So that's quite comforting to know that nearly all the gluten-free products um, were not over the 20 parts. Now, if there was no gluten-free statement on there, um, a much higher percentage were contaminated, about 10% uh, had contamination levels. And in, unlike what Tricia Thompson found, they found that if there was a gluten um, precautionary statement or a gluten or wheat precautionary statement, just about 38% of the samples were over 20 parts per million. So in that case, the, the, they, it was true that the, the grains uh, or the flours and grains were highly contaminated if they had a precautionary statement. So that's some interesting um, results. So you can see we've got a real mixed bag of results, and it really could vary depending on the product, the sample, the lot number, but it gives you a sense of what was going on there. Next slide. So what should we recommend? So what should we do? Well, when you're buying gluten-free grains, inherently gluten-free grains, you should be choosing ones that have a gluten-free claim. So the grains, flours, starches, mixes, baked products, cereals, pulses, and pastas, we want to find those ideally in a perfect world with a gluten-free claim and or um, if they're certified, even better. Although remember, we did see that one product that was certified and it was contaminated. So something got through the, uh, there was an oops there. So you also want to purchase products um, from companies that have really good manufacturing process practices and they have rigid quality control where they're testing ingredients and final products for gluten. So just given you an example, here's Kinnikinick Foods. There's the, the little CCA logo on the bottom right there. That's certified. <clears throat> the next one, they're making a gluten-free claim on that test. So it has to meet the regulation for gluten-free. And then there's the quinoa that has a, a different certification from um, the GFCO in the States. So ideally, that's what we're recommending. However, we have been going back and forth on rice. Um, we, and we're still having these discussions. And because, as I mentioned, rice tends to be a much lower risk ingredient um, if it's just pure plain rice, not ones that have got a seasoning blend. So we, um, we say ideally you should uh, purchase rice that's labeled gluten-free, but often it's more expensive and it's not as easy to find. So that would probably be the one grain where we would say if you can't find gluten-free labeled rice, um, the regular rice would most likely be um, very safe. But all the other gluten-free and inherently grains and flours, those ones we would recommend that you purchase those with a gluten-free claim. Next. So I hope everybody's staying with me. Now it's time for a little uh, humor here. <coughs> I do apologize for this cough. Um, I'm sure many of you feel, as I do, that we're playing gluten roulette. Is it safe? Is it not? Um, we're always having to read labels, and then we have to make decisions, especially if there's a precautionary statement. And in our CCA survey, we received many comments. Next. So in addition to asking people to answer those questions, 845 people out of the 2,346, that's 36% of the respondents, one in three, gave us a whole bunch of comments about their concerns about labeling. And so I will group them um, into um, categories. So they were either, they voiced opinions on may contain and other precautionary statements, uh, or may contain wheat uh, when there was that on there with a gluten-free claim. Uh, they had lots of opinions on gluten-free claims versus no gluten-free claim, about the certification program and other certifications, gluten-free claims in restaurants, uh, and uh, gluten-free foods in long-term care facilities and other institutions. Next. We also heard from you um, some of the, um, the questions were the concerns about gluten in medications and over-the-counter products, the cost of gluten-free foods, tax exemption for gluten-free foods, and uh, 
medica uh, could they find a medication for celiac disease so we wouldn't have to worry about this darn diet? And a lot of people thanked the CCA for their work, uh, especially advocating for improved labeling and food safety standards and education. Next. So I'm going to go through um, just real briefly some of these um, key points that a lot of people um, mentioned about the may contains and other precautionary statements. I think everyone, there was an overwhelming agreement that they're confusing, frustrating, and very controversial. They were, con uh, and a, a lot of people too were confused about the difference between a contained statement versus a may contain statement and other types of precautionary statements. And many did not consider may contains the same as made in a shared facility with wheat or made on shared equipment with wheat. They were treating each statement with various risk levels. And as many of you know, we spend a lot of time calling companies, asking about their ingredients, how they manufacture the products, do they test, what uh, more about their labeling statements in order to determine the level of risk and comfort with that product. Next. So now I thought I'd have a little show and tell because I've been doing a lot of talking about technical stuff. So let's just kind of have some fun here and look at some interesting labels. Here's a product. If you look in the ingredients up at the top, it says gluten-free oat flour. Then you go down to the contain statement and they list the sesame seeds in the milk and then they say pure oats. So um, technically pure oats, I mean it should be gluten-free oats because they've listed it as gluten-free oat flour so it's making that claim of gluten-free. And then they throw in a may contain tree nuts and traces of wheat. So one is, that makes me um, very confused when I see all these variations on a theme. Next. The next product you can see sans gluten-free, it says gluten-free up at the top of this beef uh, flavored noodle, rice noodle soup. And you look through all the ingredients and there are no gluten containing ingredients. Then you go next to the contains and you see anchovy and soy. But then there's a precautionary statement saying manufactured in a facility that also processes wheat, egg, peanut, crustacean, shellfish, tree nuts, and milk. So, um, looks gluten-free, it's got the gluten-free claim, but they are just warning you that it's manufactured in that statement or in that, in that facility. Next, here's some organic white quinoa, but then you look at the allergen statement down there and it says product may contain traces of gluten, wheat, and mustard. Next one. This is a really confusing one. Okay. So you look through the ingredients, there's a protein blend and soluble corn fiber, almonds, water, chocolate flavors, et cetera, et cetera. So you don't see any gluten containing ingredients in the list of ingredients, but in the contain statement, I'm sorry this wrapper kind of got cut off, but they're saying that it contains milk, almonds, and wheat. Um, and there's two little asterisks after the wheat, and then they're saying trace amounts are unavoidable in field grains. The oats used in this product are certified and it certified gluten-free. So that is another confusing one. Um, wheat, if wheat was not added to the product, it shouldn't be in the contained statement. That statement should actually be that it may contain trace amounts of, of wheat due to, un, you know, but avoid unavoidable in the field grains. I mean, are they out there measuring? I'm not sure. But um, anyway, so that um, is a bit of a confusing label. Next. So here's an example of a gluten-free claim. It's got a certification in the center. Um, there's a check mark, GF Pro Cert Certified. You look at the ingredients, there's no gluten-containing ingredients, there's no contained statement, but they are telling individuals with food allergies, this product is made in a facility that also processes food containing wheat, milk, soy, eggs, tree nuts, and seeds, including sunflower seeds. In addition, they also test, they do gluten testing, and they do have strict allergen control measures implemented at all levels of production. Um, and they don't use any peanuts, fish, or shellfish. So that, that's quite a, a comprehensive statement, but at least they're telling you it's made in the facility, but they are making the gluten-free claim. Next. Now, um, what we heard from people about some of the comments about may contain and other precautionary statements, people are saying there is expending an excessive amount of time looking at ingredients that contains, may contains, and other warnings, the gluten-free claims and certifications. And most frequent comment I saw when I read through all of those comments were that they strongly felt companies are overusing these precautionary statements as liability protection and not because of a real level of risk. And we are seeing that because there's a real proliferation of warning statements uh, on products and they feel that they're needlessly avoiding products um, and as a result, they're having less choices in their, for their gluten-free diet and they definitely want better regulations for their use. 
next. And here's examples of where I call really interesting labels. So heavenly spices, Himalayan pink sea salt may contain milk, soy, wheat, gluten, mustard, and sulfites. And then there's the great val value um, bay leaves below there that says may contain sesame, soy, wheat, and mustard. So we're, we're starting to see a lot of um, interesting claims on ingredients that shouldn't have gluten in them. And the next one. And here, um, Walmart, we're seeing a lot of Walmart products where they're putting a lot of um, uh, may contains. So there's no gluten containing ingredients in the list. There's none in the contain statement, just eggs and mustard, but they're saying may contain milk, wheat, soy, sesame, and fish. Next. And, and, and people also express concerns that they were having difficulty finding certain categories of food without a precautionary statement, especially nuts and seeds and pulses. And here you can see these roasted and unsalted shelled sunflower seeds have a may contain peanuts, tree nuts, sesame, milk, soy, wheat, mustard. So a lot of allergens being listed. Next. Other comments too about may contains and other precautionary statements with a gluten-free claim, a lot of people didn't realize that you could actually have both a may contain wheat and a gluten-free claim. They found it very confusing and they had a real difficulty in determining if there was a real risk for people with celiac. And they did not feel they should be allowed in products, especially those that are certified GFCP or other certifications. Next. So these are just a couple examples of here is a, it's on the front of the, the um, pumpkin cheesecake um, mix that it's gluten free, but then you go over and you don't see them in the ingredients. It just says it contains milk. And this product is paired, prepared and packaged using a machine that has come con in contact with wheat, gluten, tree nuts, sesame, eggs, peanuts, soy, and mustard. So there's a, a, a gluten free claim with a, a may contain. Next one. Then we look at popcorn. Um, Again, may contain tree nuts, peanuts, sesame, wheat, milk, and soy, but all it is is just popcorn, canola oil, cane sugar, and sea salt. Next. This one, um, there is no gluten-containing ingredients. They do say it has coconut and soy, but they tell you it's produced in a facility that also produces peanuts, wheat, dairy, and eggs, but they say that their gluten-free products are routinely tested using the ELISA method to ensure that there isn't, is less than 20 parts per million of gluten, so they are giving you a little bit more that they are testing. Now what about next products with a gluten-free claim versus no gluten-free claim? A lot of people said they would only buy products with a gluten-free claim and if there were two similar products they'll always purchase the one with the gluten-free versus those without a claim. And people want way more products uh, uh, available that have gluten-free claims. And they, some people wanted all products that did not contain gluten to have a gluten-free claim. But you run the risk then of having something like bottled water or butter where there would never be gluten. And that can be a challenge as well because that's an overuse of the gluten-free claim. Next. So here's examples of companies that are doing it right um, for in the gluten-free world. You can see on Enjoy Life on the top left, they're even telling you that these oats that are in the, the gluten-free oats are purity protocol gluten-free oats, just under their logo up on the top um, left. Um, they're telling you it's purity protocol gluten-free oats, and they are saying it's made in a dedicated nut and gluten-free facility. Uh, then there's the Shar Chibata. They are also saying certified gluten-free, and they're telling you it contains soy, but it is certified gluten-free. Next. Now, what about products with a gluten-free claim again versus no gluten-free claim? They don't always trust the gluten-free claim, so a lot of people are still calling companies to confirm manufacturing processes, testing, um, et cetera, and they really want the gluten threshold much lower than 20 parts per million. Um, we could have a whole other teleconference or webinar on that topic. Um, but the vast majority of research shows that the threshold level is uh, at 20 parts is a safe threshold level. And as I mentioned, most manufacturers are aiming for no detectable gluten because they don't want to be at the edge of the cliff and have a potential recall. Um, but they felt that products with a gluten free claim should have be held to the same standard as a peanut free um, uh, and other allergen free. Next. The other thing that people do is they look on the package for certification symbols, especially the GFCP, the Gluten-Free Certification Program from the CCA. And many will only buy certified gluten-free products. Because, and they say it makes life so much easier because they can trust the symbol and know the product is safe. And they'd love to see more child-friendly gluten-free certified products. Next. So here are just a few examples where you can see in Canada of the, the GFCP logo on the pastas and, and that spice mix, the Italian spice blend. Next. 
There are other um, certification bodies uh, around the world and that you can see here's another example of a certificate certification. Next. So um, when it came to those certifications, um, a lot of people would only buy products made in a dedicated facility and they, they felt that the, if the certification bodies should only have products made in dedicated facilities. Um, but they recognize that certification is expensive and many small companies can't afford it. Um, and that often the certified products are more expensive than the non-certified. And just wrapping up with these last few comments, next one. The general comments were people were frustrated with typical answers that they got from companies regarding the status. You know, we don't know the steps our ingredient suppliers took, so we can't make a statement about the gluten-free status. There may be cross-contamination in the plant, so we can't guarantee it's gluten-free. And we could probably write a book, I could write another book on all the kind of answers that you get when you call the, the call centers. Um, people said that some of the people said they were very sensitive to small amounts of gluten and get ill for days. So they are really concerned that the labeling they can trust. And certainly the uncertainty about the labeling uh, causes significant frustration and anxiety resulting in people's decreased quality of life. Next. So the key comments that also came out is that our health depends on consistent, clear and not misleading labels. And they do not feel that may contain and other precautionary statements and on products with a gluten-free claim should be allowed. And they want stricter regulations for may contain and other pro precautionary labeling statements. And they want more products with a gluten-free claim or GFCP certified. So that wraps up the summary. So now I want to just move in the last few slides um, before we wrap up and just tell you that we are fortunate here in Canada, the um, Bureau of Chemical Safety, which also um, is involved in the uh, areas of food allergens and gluten related disorders. They are known for their work in many areas, especially when it comes to food allergies and gluten related issues. Next slide. And they've been uh, partnering Next slide, with the um, Food Allergy uh, Research and Resource Program in Nebraska, FARP, and they have been taking a strong leadership role in food allergies, and their goal is, is to increase consultation, uh, information exchange, and harmonization in the areas of food allergies, allergens and analytical me methods. And that also includes gluten, they're uh, doing work in that. And they are hosting an upcoming workshop in Edmonton, uh, and they want to work with better, they want to have better and consistent detection of allergens and gluten, um, so that manufacturers and regulatory divisions in governments can develop better guidelines, policies, and regulations surrounding the labeling. So the next article um, came from the team at um, dietitian at Romer Labs, Adrian Rogers, and um, they've written this article called "Precautionary Allergy Labeling Information for Consumers or Just Covering Your Assets." Um, uh, and uh, they uh, are working on developing realistic risk assessments for food allergies and gluten sources in foods for manufacturers, um, so that precautionary labeling can be much more accurate and helpful for consumers. Next. Romer Labs have also um, put out an article for manufacturers, 10 Musts of Allergen Management. And um, I just want to read a little bit about this. They're indicating that there's certainly a proliferation of allergen precautionary statements. And these are confusing and all too confusing and all too often all encompassing. In other words, they're just putting so many different um, may contains allergen statements that it's, it's clear that they really didn't check there wasn't a check conducted on their products. They're just putting that on there. So the result, consumers are losing confidence in the information that they read on the label. And ideally, the information that's conveyed on that label should be the result of an exhaustive evaluation of the real risk of the presence of an allergen or gluten source in a product. Um, this evaluation should take into account a comprehensive risk assessment of the presence of allergens comprising the whole product through the whole production change and an appropriate allergen management plan. Next. And I just want to read on this next slide um, is that the product label can either be a powerful tool or a complete hindrance depending on the information it contains and how it is conveyed. conveyed. The main problems come from voluntary allergen labeling as the infamous may contain statements. Labeling should not be misleading, ambiguous, or confusing, and should be based on relevant scientific data. Appropriate and informative labeling serves to establish your brand as a trustworthy and informs the consumer about his or her opinions honestly. Labels that state every possible allergen are usually perceived as useless and protect the company more than the consumer. 
So we are seeing some work being done in this area, but there's still a lot more to be done. So in wrapping up our webinar, here's a few key messages and things that you can do. Just as a reminder, the contain statement is not the same as a may contains precautionary statement. The enhanced labeling in Canada for food allergens and gluten sources and added sulfites are mandatory regulations. They must be declared, all the priority allergens, gluten sources, and sulfites, either in the ingredient list or in a contained statement that follows immediately after the list of ingredients when it's added to a product. So that's the contained statement, different than the food allergy precaution statements where there are no specific regulations. It's voluntary, so the manufacturers can decide whether they want to make that declaration using their own standards and guidelines to alert consumers of the possible inadvertent presence of an allergen, gluten source, or sulfite in the product. So remember, may contain statements or other precautionary warning statements are not um, mandated, they are voluntary, and there is no defined regulations other than coming in 2021. They'll have to follow those right after the contain statement. Next. So what should you, what should, reminder about precautionary labeling, technically they should be truthful and not misleading, although we are finding that very confusing for most people. Uh, they should not be a substitute for their good manufacturing practices. And they should only be used when despite all the reasonable measures have been taken that the inadvertent presence of an allergen in the food is unavoidable. And uh, we're finding that um, the use of precautionary statements when there's no real risk is a problem and that Health Canada is also uh, discouraging that just to put them on as a blanket one. But without specific regulations, uh, we clearly need more research to develop a scientific risk-based assessment in the development of standardized regulations. So just in wrapping up the last three, four slides, people have asked me, um, what should we do? Um, they want black and white guidelines, but it is often very difficult because we've seen evidence of products containing gluten, when there was no may contain statement for wheat or gluten. And on the other hand, we've seen evidence that show that products with may contains uh, can be t contaminated and at other times they're not. So Health Canada does say um, clearly, and we, we say that if there is no gluten-free claim, but you do see in the contain statement wheat or gluten containing ingredients, that means they're there and you have to avoid that product. But what do you do when you don't see a gluten-free claim no gluten containing ingredients in the list, but it may contain wheat. And you can see I'm almost looking like I'm a politician. I'm not being uh, black or white. I've got question marks in both because we see that there is such a, a challenge as I've talked about in this webinar about whether these products are safe or not. Uh, Health Canada does state that individuals with wheat allergies or celiac disease should avoid products with a may contain wheat precautionary type of statement. But um, you know, some people are finding that very difficult. And so we're still struggling with what guidance to, to give people because of the, what we know about how these statements are being used. And uh, also the fact that if there is no may contain wheat, people are assuming that that is safer than the one that has a may contain wheat. And we've seen cases where Tricia has clearly pointed out, uh, Tricia Thompson from Gluten-Free Watchdog, that those products were contaminated even though there was no may contain. But the gluten-free claim, yes, is allowed. We can trust it. The gluten-free claim and then it may contain wheat is allowed because it still has to meet the regulatory threshold of under 20 parts per million. So next slide. So what can you do? Well, you can try, and I do it all the time, calling companies is ask questions. Um, try to get up to somebody that who is familiar more with their allergen control plan and ask, do they do dedicated areas or rooms? Do they have dedicated equipment and employees who produce the gluten-free foods? Uh, are they um, ask about the procedures in the manufacturing plant for when the ingredients are re uh, you receive them and how they're stored to keep their gluten-free materials away, gluten-containing items? Ask how they do their equipment cleaning. Are gluten-free items produced on separate days or at least at the beginning of the runs? And make sure you thank them for helping you when you can get a decent answer out of them. So the last two couple slides here, I'm just going to tell you, well, Melissa, I think we skipped two. Oh, uh, there should be um, recommendations for purchasing gluten-free specialty products. Try the next slide. I don't know where it disappeared to. 
Okay. Well, I will just tell you what that, oh, there we are, um, that you should choose gluten-free grains, flours, starches, mixes, baked products, cereals, pulses, and pastas from companies that will make a gluten-free claim, that have good manufacturing practices with rigid quality control, that have protocols uh, where they test their incoming ingredients and their final products for gluten using appropriate methods. Um, we know that people should avoid regular oats and only choose gluten-free oats. And if you're unable to find gluten-free labeled pulses to do what I uh, mentioned earlier is to do the visual inspection and sort and remove any of the foreign grains and materials and then put them in a colander, the clean pulses, and rinse them thoroughly with cold water before using. And the last one is certainly to avoid buying from bulk bins or stores that buy bulk products in bulk and they repackage them into smaller containers because the area and equipment can be easily cross-contaminated with gluten-containing ingredients. Next. Uh, so in closing, I just want to say that in my book, this is the most recent uh, fifth edition, I have a boatload of information about how to follow the gluten-free diet, and I have a very extensive chapter on gluten-free and food allergen labeling in Canada and the U.S., as well as chapters on gluten threshold levels, parts per million, and testing, and a lot more information. So you can go to ShellyCase.com and see more about the book, and it's available on Amazon or Indigo. And... Um, so in closing, I'd like just to let you know that the CCA Professional Advisory Council has been working diligently on a guidance docu document on labeling, including what I've covered on this webinar tonight. And when it is finalized, it will be on the CCA webinar. So I hope in this uh, hour that you've got a really good craft course on labeling and that it has provided you more insight into the complexities and the challenges we have with gluten and, and allergen labeling and these precautionary allergen labeling uh, statements. So thank you so much for listening. I'm going to turn it back to Melissa because she has some important information to share. Great. Thanks a lot, Shelley. That was a, a wealth of information, and I know it's uh, getting late, especially for those who may be hanging on from the, uh, from the East Coast. Um, so thank you very much. And I also want to thank Graham Research, who helped us uh, uh, execute that uh, May Contain survey back in May, who uh, did gathering all that data for us. So before I get to two questions, I just want to remind everyone that the webinar has been recorded. So watch the CCA's YouTube channel, watch for announcements on the recording, so you can watch again, share with the individuals, share with family members, anybody who may be um, helping to, you know, purchase uh, items for your family. Um, we also have a number of other interesting videos and webinars on our channel, including our recent State of Celiac event, uh, which Shelley was a part of to discuss some of the major issues and some of our past home help at home webinars as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, CCA would not be able to do the work that it does, um, the incredible generosity of our donors. They are truly our heroes. Um, their investment in our community allows work to be done for everyone. Um, help us make new advancements on critical issues like the labeling issue. Uh, we hope you'll support our annual festive campaign and help us raise $30,000 by December 31st to fund our advocacy, education efforts, and investment in research and support um, of individuals who call the CCA for their assistance. Um, so we need your help. Watch um, also what you can do for this particular cause. We may need you to write letters. We may need you to tweet out to companies. We may need you to help you know, make a presentation so together we can really make a difference. And as Shelley said, the PAC guidance document on labeling um, will be coming and we'll make sure that if you're on our mailing list that you'll get it directed right into your inbox. Um, there, again, just a reminder that we have a link to the evaluation of how we did tonight to help us keep improving what we're doing. And we will pick a random participant uh, from our list of individuals who actually attended the webinar uh, tonight to win one of copies uh, of Shelley's book. So, um, and just, just as a note, we've got an upcoming GF 101 session. Again, it's free with our registered dietitian, Gory Bawa, coming up on December 16th. And just a slide to let you know how you can contact us. So, Melissa, um, Shelley, do we have, yeah. um, I mean, for people that want to listen, maybe we could, you could pull out just, I see that we got 21 Q and A's. Um, yeah. Do you, do you want to, I'm happy to take some questions if yeah. um, those people are still hanging on because uh, they patiently went through and listened to it. And I apologize for having to speak so quickly, but it was such a complex topic. We could have done a whole day on this uh, topic of labeling, but uh, let's see if there's some questions that I might be able to answer. 
Okay, yeah, so let's run through some, and, and again, people will be aware that we'll, um, we're gonna, we've recorded some of these, and then we'll come up maybe with a Q&A based on the questions that are asked so people don't miss out. So just make sure you use the question box because we are downloading the question uh, Q&A box as well. So we've got a question from Mark. He's saying, any thoughts on why people manufacturing in a certified gluten facility would not mark a product gluten-free? Um, possibly because they're also trying to target the product to people that aren't gluten free. And we know that sometimes when consumers that don't have, uh, that aren't following the gluten free diet, they may think that the product isn't that good or doesn't taste great. So they wouldn't want to buy it if they saw the gluten free claims. That would be about the only reason why, um, it might not be labeled. Gluten. I can think a main reason why. Next question. Yeah, I mean, uh, anonymous attendees, I have encouraged a chicken broth that says it's gluten-free on the carton, no official gluten-free seal, but yeast extract is listed in the ingredients. I know yeast extract, if not specifically indicated that it is barley-based, should be treated as not safe. Would this be an example of a false gluten-free claim? Um, you would hope that the company understands the regulations for um, allergens and gluten sources. And if that, I mean, autolyzed yeast and autolyzed yeast extract um, can, um, most of them are derived from baker's yeast, which is gluten free, but some of these yeast extracts can be um, derived from brewer's yeast, which is not gluten free. So I've seen it on some package labels where um, it will say yeast extract and then in brackets. Um, barley gluten or in the contained statement barley so uh, if it's making the gluten-free claim then it shouldn't have um, a yeast derived from gluten so it should okay. be okay okay great uh, Heather's question what about something labeled pure oats or wheat free oats would that be considered gluten-free great question Heather that's a great question um, Health Canada says you should be using the word gluten-free oats so I would be calling that company to determine if they are actually using a gluten-free oats. And maybe they're just not aware of that regulation and that's why they're calling them wheat-free or pure. Or it might be they're still remembering the old regulations where you couldn't call them gluten-free, but you could say they were free of wheat, rye, and barley. And that's what the companies were doing prior to the 2015 uh, marketing authorization that does allow now those oats to be called gluten-free. Okay, great. All right, um, Sarah is asking a question, could a manufacturer claim wheat-free and not include the precautionary statement even though there is a, even though there is a wheat, uh, sorry, could a manufacturer claim wheat-free and not include precautionary statement even though there was wheat in the facility? Yes, because remember they're voluntary. The manufacturer doesn't have to, to make those may contain statements. Some choose and some do not. And that's the problem until we have uh, concrete regulations like we do with the actual contains and the mandatory allergen declarations in the ingredients until we have um, those regulations it's really left up to each individual manufacturer whether they choose to use those um, precautionary statements or not okay um, I'm surprised to hear about flaxseed we have been eating it at home as pudding with chia seeds thinking that they're gluten-free should we stop eating it ask Leah Lena um, well, I know Trisha did do some testing on the flax and, and she found most of them were okay, but um, a couple were elevated and I know Health Canada when they did the testing they were elevated and I've gotten sacks of flax from the farmer that gave me those uh, lentils, he also gave me the flax and when I've gone through I have found the odd wheat grain in there and barley. So they, here on the prairies, especially in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, farmers rotate their crops and so it might be um, wheat this year, next year it's flax. Uh, and so there can be some volunteer wheat that can, can pop up in if it's not um, done like they do the purity protocol dedicated oats that you can have it maybe in the uh, augers, in the bins, in the, the truck that's transporting it to the elevator. So um, ideally, yes, when it comes to flax and hemp, we should be looking for gluten-free claims on those. Okay, great. Uh, so someone had a question about pulses um, with may contain wheat statements considered high or low risk if thoroughly washed at home prior to cooking? Yes, I think that if you can sort through them, look for the foreign grains and thoroughly rinse them, um, you can, if there was any contaminating uh, wheat dust or if there was a grain there, that they would be acceptable for people with celiac disease to consume. Okay. Um, 
we've got another question here. Are manufacturers permitted to use may contain gluten versus solely may contain wheat? Uh, what about may contain barley rye? Um, would, yes, would they be, could use any, yeah. there's no, as I mentioned, there's no regulation. So you can have a, any kind of variation on a theme. Uh, manufacturers can use any type of claim okay. on a may contain. All right. So, um, but I should uh, mention that I didn't I didn't share that on the on the presentation. But just remember, if uh, if a product has a wheat free claim, that doesn't necessarily mean it's gluten free because it could contain barley or rye. And I've seen that in the wheat free cookies on the market, um, where when you go look at the list of ingredients, it contains barley flour. So technically, yes, there's no wheat, but it contains barley, and that's a gluten source. So it's wheat free does not mean the same. It's not equal to gluten free. All right, so this is a good question because not everyone understands. Is there a th wheat threshold for wheat allergic individuals? Uh, no, and that's the problem. Why, when I showed you Health Canada and FARP is trying to do these allergen methodology and detection um, studies and research, is they're trying to find at what level the people with the, the say, an anaphylaxis, the peanut allergy person or the wheat allergy person, at what level does that cause a problem versus what level doesn't? And because we don't have any known thresholds for allergens, unlike gluten, we do have a threshold. We have research to show that the 20 parts is safe, uh, under 20 parts. We don't have that for the allergens. And I think that's what's causing so much trouble because people that have severe anaphylactic type allergic reactions, if they get a trace drop, a puff of, of that little bit of that protein, that could, could be very serious for them. Whereas someone with celiac, it most likely would not be. And so, but they're having those allergen precautionary statements are really more likely trying to warn these allergic consumers of the small levels of gluten compared to people with celiac. But unfortunately, that's all we have. The may contains are used for both uh, communities. All right, uh, Sarah's got a great question here. Um, um, what's the difference between something so it's certified gluten-free versus something making a company making a GF claim without certification. Shelley, is that basically down to independent verification of a facility versus a, maybe a, a, a self-made claim or? Yeah, it's a, I mean, those that are certified like the GFCP, that's third party. It's being rigorously um, inspected and has to meet um, uh, outside agency guidelines for um, making sure that the product is gluten-free. The self-certifying, um, I have seen companies, and I do know of some of those companies that self-certify, and I know they're doing a very good job. They have a lab, an in-house lab, and they're testing, and they've chosen not to do the certification, third-party certification, usually because of cost. Um, but, you know, the concern is the self-certification. What is the yardstick that they're using? What's the measuring stick that they're using to determine if that's safe or not? So, um, ideally, we like to support GFCP, Gluten-Free Certification Program. That's great. So we've got someone who's a very bit of a long question, but I think essentially the difference between she's just moved up here from the U.S. versus Canada in sort of like products made in the U.S. may be labeled gluten-free in, in the U.S., um, but wondering about uh, in Canada. And I know it can be different. You have to be careful that just because it's in the U.S. doesn't mean it's, it's, it's identical here in Canada. Right. Um, I will tell you that there are a lot of similarities. And in my book, I actually have in that labeling chapter columns where I have FDA, USDA, and Health Canada for different ingredients and labeling claims and things so that you can see what the, the rules and regulations are. And although there, there are a lot of similarities, the 20 parts per million threshold is the same. They, they don't allow wheat, rye, or barley uh, in products labeled gluten-free. Um, uh, unless it's something like um, specially processed wheat starch that the Europeans are using in the sh like the char croissants where that wheat starch has been um, uh, highly processed and uh, very trace levels of gluten are there and when it's used in a product um, it would have no detectable gluten or be well under the 20 parts but there so there are a lot of similarities I would say I think we're more blessed here in Canada because we on uh, the CCA we have one national celiac organization we have a great uh, close relationship with Health Canada and CFIA and uh, uh, CFIA is is routinely um, doing surveillance for allergen and gluten claims. And in fact, they just released, I just shared that on Twitter uh, yesterday, um, that um, the health can our CFIA has released their uh, surveillance claims on looking at products with gluten-free oats to see uh, if they're actually truly uh, under the 20 parts. So we are fortunate here. Um, we do have, um, I think, more surveillance of the claims than what's happening from what I hear from my colleagues in the States. 
Okay, I'm just uh, just scanning quickly the because it's a few are a bit off topic, and we can definitely uh, be answered in some of our gluten free 101. Um, you know, kind of a bit more on a restaurant focus. Um, someone says, can you really have an overuse of a GF claim though? Would that be a bad thing? <laughs> um, I don't know. As long as it's truthful and not misleading and it's, it truly is under the 20 parts. It's when I think if a company just slaps it on for a marketing um, and I, I guess, and I'm, I am concerned about the overuse and I know I've had great discussions with Health Canada about this is that it really leads people to believe, and I'll give the example of the bottled water. I've actually seen gluten-free claim on it. So if you're a newly diagnosed and you're trying to figure out this gluten-free diet and you see five brands of gluten of, of water and one has got a gluten-free claim, that makes you think that maybe there could be gluten in water and that um, the other ones aren't safe, so I better buy the one with the gluten-free claim, which might even be more expensive. So I think we have to be careful. I know that's what uh, Health Canada is trying to balance um, the use of a gluten-free claim and say the, um, the unnecessary use because the intent of B.24.018, which is the gluten-free rule, it really was designed for um, products and ingredients where there could be a great risk for gluten contamination or you need to have a substitute for that. So for example, if you're making um, a baking mix, you obviously have to, you need to use gluten-free ingredients to make that baking mix. So that would be a logical food to have a gluten-free claim, whereas butter or bottled water, that is a big stretch. Exactly. Um, Elizabeth asking, I have a problem finding gluten-free nuts locally. They all say they may contain wheat. Uh, what's your stand on nuts? Uh, great con, uh, question. Grappling with that uh, as we speak on the PAC. Um, and I've been talking to my American colleagues as well because they're saying similar things that they're seeing a lot of may contains uh, and that the risk for shelled um, uh, raw nuts and most of them are coming from um, manufacturers that are just doing nuts and being uh, processed. So we think there's a real overuse of the may contains on the nuts. We will, um, we're gathering lists of companies and brand names that um, are making gluten-free claims on the nuts so that for that added level of confidence for consumers. But um, it's really tough to know whether the, those nuts that have these may contain wheats, whether they're really a high risk or not. I would say um, it's the grains, yeah. the grains, the pulses, um, the, and of course the oats, those are, and the flax and the uh, hemp seeds, I think are a much higher risk than the nuts. So Heidi's question is, can you wash off gluten possibly on contaminate, contaminated items like nuts, seeds, and pulses? You probably could. Um, mind you, nuts are fatty and, uh, you know, things might be able to penetrate in it more. The shell, uh, the ones in the shells are not an issue. Um, but uh, almonds, again, uh, I would say almonds are really a low risk. But it's, um, it, yeah, it's really controversial about whether people need to buy nuts and seeds um, with a gluten-free claim or uh, ones, or can you have them with a may contain? So I don't think the verdict is out there. I mean, ideally, if you can find them with a gluten-free claim, that's great. Then you know for sure. Um, but we don't really know if there's a uh, what kind of risk it is for gluten um, on the ones on the may contain wheats on nuts. Um, okay, just want to be kind of cognizant of time. Um, maybe just a couple more. Um, what about natural flavors? Um, someone's saying, I assume there isn't. If there isn't a may contain statement, are they safe? Um, well, actually, natural flavorings, you know, all kinds of, uh, and I have a whole chapter on all these questionable ingredients and talk about how they're made and whether they could contain gluten. I mean, the flavoring agents that we're most concerned about, obviously, it would have gluten, is barley malt, barley malt extract, barley malt syrup, barley malt flavoring, um, and hydrolyzed wheat protein. And because of the mandatory allergen and gluten de declaration regulations, if it was hydrolyzed wheat protein, they couldn't call it natural flavoring. They have to call it hydrolyzed wheat protein. If it's auto yeast extract or yeast extract derived from a gluten source like barley gluten, it would have to be declared. Um, so um, natural flavorings in Canada, um, that if it had a gluten source, it would have to be called out. Okay. I want to let everybody know too, we have, CC has a pocket dictionary that sort of the handy list of ingredients when you're not quite sure, you know, um, and it's right. Great, low cost great resource. And you can, great resource and uh, there also is an app version of it as well. Um, someone has quite a good question, um, Peter. Do imported foods have have to attach um, labels that adhere to Canadian regulations? 
Excellent question. Absolutely. Regardless of where the product is made, it must meet, when it's sold in Canada, it must meet Health Canada's regulations for gluten-free and it must meet the regulations for mandatory declaration of any allergen, priority allergens and gluten sources and sulfites. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Um, if you have celiac, what other additives in foods, food or medicine or supplements can cause allergic reactions? Someone's highly allergic to calcium carbonate and has some other, uh, other inflammatory responses um, to titanium minerals and supplements. Well, I, I mean, I think that's a really difficult question. Yeah. Uh, I, we do know that some artificial colors like tartrazine, um, yellow dye number five, and some other ones can cause uh, reactions for some people um, that can cause urticaria hives and stuff. But I think that that's a very specific case by case question. So we can't make a blanket statement on that. Okay. Well, I think we're going to cut it off there. It's uh, 10.30 and your voice must be just uh, just be just be about spent. So I want to thank everyone who, who hung on and uh, um, asked some great questions. And as I said, we're going to download this question log and we'll get Shelly and maybe some other team members uh, of our registered dietitians on our PAC to review them. And maybe we can come out with some Q&As either through our social media, through a document. Uh, it may even liven up for uh, allow us to do another webinar to uh, ensure we've got everyone's uh, questions. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Please, you know, as the slide says, you know, every day someone, um, you know, is diagnosed and we want to be there to help them. Hopefully we were there to help you through this webinar. So please consider donating to our festive campaign so people like Shelley can continue doing the work on behalf of the community, talking to Health Canada, talking to manufacturers. Um, this gluten solution hasn't quite been solved yet, that's, uh, that's for sure. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you, Shelley. Thank and, you so uh, much. And we'll definitely send out the webinar link when it's ready to go, uh, when we've had a chance to download it and make some edits. So watch for your link in your emails and online on our YouTube channel. So thanks again, everyone, and have a safe and happy holiday season.